stand with us as we celebrate the resurrection.
to sing with us this morning as we sing about this one and only Jesus, the one who goes before us.
in your story. And so, Lord, this morning, we just ask that you would just walk with us. Lord, I know many come, and, and life is not easy. And so, Lord, this morning, we just come with a sense of hope. Hope that you are there with us, that want to guide our steps. You want to give us new life. You want to help us in the times of need. And, Lord, and more than anything, you want to help us to see the praise of what you do amongst us. And so, Lord, this morning, we just thank you for being a God who is so faithful to be in the midst of our presence. And, Lord, just this morning, we just thank you so much for the many churches in the community that are gathering this morning to celebrate your resurrection. Lord, we pray blessings over each and every one of them. Lord, more than anything else, we want to see the city of Midland to come to know you. And so, Lord, we pray for the services all over our our city and our county, Lord, that, Lord, you would just move in those places. Be with those that will gather in those, those spaces, Lord. Will you just speak to their lives and encourage them? And, Lord, more than anything, as I pray all the time, I pray, Lord, that as we walk in this place, we would leave different because of what you are doing in the midst of our lives. So, Lord, this morning, we just ask that you would guide our steps, speak to our lives, and help us to know what it is that you want for us. Lord, this morning, as we gather, we pray that... You would just be with JP as he brings your word, as he guides uh, what you would like to share with us today. Lord, will you just help us be open to receiving what you want to speak into our lives? And Lord, more, more than anything, as we um, take offering this morning, receive the, as you receive these gifts from us, Lord, will you just be use it for a blessing for your church, for, your, for this community, and beyond? Because, Lord, we just want to see your world come to know you. And so, Lord, thank you as we come and we celebrate the resurrected King. Lord, we give you all the praise this morning. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, kids, you are dismissed to go to Children's Church. And if you take a moment, say Happy Easter to somebody next to you. That would be awesome.
She turned and said to him in a Hebrew, Rabbi, which means teachers, Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. So Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. While it was still dark, while it was still dark, Walter had grown up in Alabama. As an African American, he had many uh, obstacles to overcome early on in his life. And being in the deep south, there were so many to overcome, and yet he had been able to carve out an existence, and in fact, been able to, to start his own tree-cutting business. You see, in the South, there was a time in which cotton was no, uh, uh, no longer economically viable to keep uh, the economy afloat, and so they had changed from cotton to pulp trees. And this is a way in which to still use the soil and the ground, and yet the crop needed to change. And so in the midst of seeing the change, Walter changed with it, got out in front of it, and started this tree-cutting business. And he had done really well for himself. Well, good enough, we'll say it that way, right? He had an existence. And for the most part, had a great reputation in town. People had come to, to know Walter could be trusted. It was in the early 80s that this all transpired. Walter's heading home on this dirt, dusty road, the Alabama dust furling up from underneath his trusty work truck. It's a road that he carried at home every day, working tremendous hours. He knew it well, it was to take him back to his house. He finished working and had the dust and the dirt, all the sweat, all over his body. Looking forward to just being able to go home and to rest after a long day's work. And as he turns the bend to head for the final stretch home, in the middle of the road is a barricade. A barricade of sheriff cars. A sheriff whom he knew. And he screeches to a halt, and they pull him from the truck, and they arrest him. A few weeks earlier in town, there was a murder that had taken place, in which a young white woman had been murdered at the dry cleaners. The murder had gone unsolved, and the pressure on the sheriff and on the police to find somebody who finally lent itself at Walter's feet. And they took him from being arrested and from his trusty truck, they put him in on death row. But if you know anything about the criminal justice system, you know that's usually not where they hold you in order to wait for trial. Usually you go to the county jail until you go to trial, but for this reason, for whatever reason, sorry, they take him directly to death row, waiting for his trial. Walter, this guy who had carved out just enough of an existence, now sits on death row, waiting for his trial, a capital punishment trial. He waits for weeks until his trial comes, and in a day and a half, his trial is over, and he is returned, being convicted, back to death row. Could you imagine a darker place? Being let out of the cell for maybe only an hour or so a day, all by yourself. The seasons don't change in the dark, damp climate of a concrete cell. No one to talk to dim light. We can definitely say it is a deep, dark place. Many of us here are saying, JP, where in the world are you going? We do not find ourselves on death row. We probably don't know anybody on death row. And maybe in some ways it seems as foreign and as distant as the moon is from us. And yet I want to suggest for us this morning Though we don't find ourselves on death row, I have witnessed us subjugated to a sentence of dashed dreams. We have been indicted by disease, and the jury of shame has found us guilty of selfishness and pride. 
isolated, frustrated, beat down and throw down. Doubts have handcuffed us. And we find ourselves standing on death row. It's a different one. But nonetheless, it's a death row of darkness. Right? And while it was still dark, Mary, too, finds her way into the garden. This is amazing to think about this. Mary goes out while it was still dark. There's no street lamps. There's no headlamps. There's no flashlights. There's no iPhones trying to find her way. She just goes in the darkness trying to find what had been taken from her. Now we have to imagine this, that it's not just that Jesus dies, but this is the anticipation of generations upon generations upon generations. They've been told forever that a Messiah was coming. It's not that Jesus is the first ever to proclaim to be the Messiah. No, no, no. In fact, over and over again, others have come proclaiming to be the Messiah. Each and every time, though, they are met with the death and the crucifixion. The story is no different up to this point than any that have gone before it. But she just knew beyond doubt. She knew that she knew that she knew that it would be different this time. No, no, no. Surely Jesus was the Messiah. Surely it would be different. But on Friday... It wasn't. The one that whom she had put all hope and trust in was dead. Dark place. And while it was still dark, she finds her way in the garden. While it was still dark. Not simply the place where we start the Easter story, and yet for John, this is exactly where he sets this whole scene and setting, is still in the darkness. And in many ways, it's the perfect setting, right? Because on Friday, it is the deepest, darkest night of all of creation. For on Friday, when Christ is crucified and breathes his last breath for the first time, death has now entered into God and God's self. But follow with me a little bit here, right? That we recognize that when Jesus comes to live among us, that we say he is fully human, fully man. That he takes his bone of our bone, the flesh of our flesh, he breathes the same air. And we say, yes, he is human. But at the same time, we also say he is yet fully God. Fully divine, part of the Trinity, part of God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, that though those three together making up God. And so therefore, when Jesus breathes his last breath, death, for the first time, enters into God's self. We might say it this way, that if death has always been known as other than God, if death has always been known as God's forsakenness, for the first time on Friday, when Jesus breathes his last breath, the God forsakenness has now been swallowed up by God and enters into the Trinity for the first time. That now there is no place that God is not. That even God has entered into the depths and valleys and shadows of death. That we are able to proclaim that there is no place, no place that God is not, is not willing to go. It is not the curse of God that puts Christ Jesus on the cross, but it is the very love of God that what we see on Friday is the vastness of God's love, the extremes to which God goes to go any place, any place to meet us. And so this is where Mary finds herself. She finds herself while it was still dark in the shadows of a tomb with dashed dreams. While it was still dark. I don't like this. I wish John would have written it a different way. I wish he would have. But what's interesting to me, and right here, is Mary is there in the garden, in the midst of the darkness. The risen Lord and Savior finds her. In the midst of all darkness and shadows, Jesus finds Mary. Did you catch that? 
Mary didn't find Jesus. Mary goes looking for Jesus, but Mary cannot find him. Rather, it is Jesus who finds Mary. Friends, in our darkness, we do not find God, but rather God finds us. doesn't matter how dark the shadows are. God will always and forever find us. Because, friends, we are living in a place where it is still dark. Even this morning, as we met for the first time, we are starting to hear news back from Sri Lanka, right? Which 200 who have gathered for worship, who have gathered the risen Christ, have been killed with bombings of churches. I thought it was still dark. In our own doubts and wonders, if we are good enough, it is still dark. At the bottoms of the bottles that we turn to for comfort, it is still dark. In our addictions and questions of isolations, it is still dark. In the effects of poison water just 60 miles from us, it is still dark. In the slavery of humans around us, still modern day slavery, it is still dark. Though I wish John would not have written it this way, friends, maybe this was the perfect way for John to write it. I wish he would have written that Mary came to the tomb at the high noon hour when the warm, when the sun is warm, the sun is fully bright. But that's not quite the world that you and I live in, is it? Because it is still dark. It's still dark. But in the darkness, this is where God finds us. The story this summer that broke, that maybe many of you heard of, happened over in Thailand, in which there was a team, the Wild Boars, which I'm a little upset that I didn't pick that name for my team. That would have been fantastic, the Wild Boar. It just, I think that's worth a goal at least already, just an intimidation, Wild Boars. And they finished this, this soccer team in Thailand at uh, ages 11 to 16, I believe. And they just finished a practice. And at the end of practice, they decided we're going to go explore this cave system. And they'd done it before. And off they go with their coach. Ooh, I bet you he was wishing he would have uh, made some other plans. But all 13 of them go and they enter into the cave. There would be, they would try to etch their names in the cave. Initiation right. And as they enter into the cave, the waters come, the rains come down, the waters rise up, and it pushes the team farther and farther back into the cave. Some say they're about a half mile underneath the earth's surface. And for 10 days, they're trapped without food or water in the back of a cave without light, without anything. I don't know if you've ever been in a cave before, if you've reached far back, we used to explore a cave. We lived in Nashville. We'd take college students there. We'd go only. We'd go about four hours back into the cave, and you turn off all the lights. And you could not see the hand in front of you. It would touch you before you could see it. For ten days, these twelve boys and their coach find themselves in the deepest, darkest place until someone comes. A diver popping up out of the water there to give them food, rescue. What a scene it would have been to see those boys' faces the first time the diver makes eye contact with them. To know that they are not by themselves. To know it was not up to them to make their own way out. But rather they just had to sit there and to wait. Rescue was coming. Friends, it is dark around us. But the risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is seeking us. He's finding us. For it's not that Mary just goes and goes searching for herself, but in the midst of the darkest place, when she knows, she finds out that the body is gone. It's not bad enough that Jesus dies, but now they've taken her, or his body. She goes down to even a deeper, darker place. And Jesus finds her. And he calls her by name. He calls her by name. It's not just, hey, you. You guys. 
that one. But it's Mary. It's Mary. In the midst of our darkness when we cannot see, when we're stumbling around, there is a voice calling to us, stirring us, nudging us, that knows us by name, who's calling us out. And it's in that moment that Mary turns. Did you catch it? In the passage, Mary isn't facing the same way she was when she entered in. But as soon as Jesus calls her name, she now pivots and she turns to see the face of Christ in front of her. When we find ourselves in the dark places and the voice of God calls to us, He is calling us that we might turn and go the other way. He is saying to us, do not keep going into the darkest places by yourself. Would you trust me? Would you turn and come towards me? Would you gather yourself and walk step by step? Just take the next step towards me. Turn from the ways in which you were going. It doesn't mean that the darkness will just goes away. When Jesus calls out Mary's name, it doesn't say, and then the sun rose right above her and all was made light. She's still in the darkness. She still finds herself surrounded by the darkness, but her name has been called and she has turned. God is calling to you and to I. He's asking us, would you turn again today? The reason why I tell you this story about Walter in the beginning, it comes from a book called Just Mercy. I'll be honest, when I started, I couldn't put it down. I think I finished in like two or three days. I just, just had to go through it. It's the story of Walter's trial as told by his lawyer, Brian Stevenson. It's just woven through the book talking about other trials, other death row trials. Brian was, uh, was a Harvard-trained lawyer who finds himself in the Deep South immediately after graduation. And Walter is one of his first cases that he ever takes. And as he's walking through the book and telling the, the story of his trial, the evidence that comes up and the motions that he's making, and as the the case is starting to get traction. Walter, or, sorry, Brian needs to go meet with Walter's family. So they're starting to get a little bit of hope. But Walter's still on death row. And so Brian finds himself having to sit in this tension of the hope of a family and yet the reality and how hard it is to get somebody off of death row. And in the midst of that, as he's about ready to go meet the family, he has this quote. I haven't been able to get away from it. I've read it maybe almost a month ago now. And it just, it's just latched onto me. So Brian says this. He says, but Havel, and he's quoting this other writer, says, but Havel had, had said that the thing, that these were the things that they wanted, but the only thing they needed was hope. And not that pie in the sky stuff, not a preference for optimism over pessimism, but rather an orientation of the spirit. The kind of hope that creates a willingness to position oneself in a hopeless place. The kind of hope that creates a willingness to position oneself in a hopeless place and be a witness. A witness that allows one to believe in a better future, even in the face of abuse of power. That kind of hope makes one strong. Mary finds herself in the darkness. And Jesus does not wait for the sun to rise, but Jesus, being God, enters into the darkness with Mary. And Mary, hearing his voice, turns. That she herself did not wait for the sun to rise, but Mary enters into the darkness as well. And when she encounters the living God, she runs back to the disciples and she says, I have seen the Lord. The guys who had run away, who was huddled together, fearing for their life, and it is Mary who runs to them and says, I have seen the Lord. And the Lord here is 
not a nickname. It's not a pet name. Right? It's not the last name of Christ. Rather, it is a title that she is saying to them, here is the one, the Lord, the one whom I trust all of my life, all of my hopes and dreams, all of my future. I have seen him, the risen Lamb of God. The story of the Messiah is true. I have witnessed it. Death has been overcome by God. Though it is still dark, the light has come. I have witnessed it. I have witnessed it. And so the voice calls to you and I. And in one hand, it's a voice that says, turn and walk towards me. And in the other hand, it's saying to you and I, go. Go into the darkest of places. Go to the darkest of places and be a witness. Walk into the dark cubicle that's riddled with, with greed and selfishness. Go across the street of the neighborhood that is captive to isolation. Go 60 miles. Go to the neighborhoods that are ravished with economic insecurities. Go to the darkness and be a witness that collectively we can say, I have seen the Lord. That God does not wait for the sun to rise. Friends, he enters into the darkness with us. He enters into the darkness of your very place today with you. He is calling out your name. Some of you here today that may be already before I even spoke or the band even played a note whose heart and soul was being stirred by the God who had created you. Despite the dark place that you find yourself, whether it's your fault or somebody else's, that same God has been seeking after you. So this morning, I'm going to invite us to the table of the Lord. It is this table, this meal, the physical means of God's grace. And there's one side of it in which we remember 2,000 years ago. We remember that night in which he would be betrayed. But the second part of this meal, this is the one that captures me every time. The second part of this meal is it's a remembering in the future. It's a remembering forward. It's a remembering when he raises from the dead in which Christ ushers in the future, the end of history, in which all death is overcome. So here in this meal, here in this meal, we, we remember the darkness of what is, and we participate of the light of the future that is to be, as they come together at once. So friends, if you find yourself sitting here today, in the darkness of light, when you're hungering and thirsting for the grace and the love of God, then this is a meal for you. This meal does not belong to us here at Midnight's. This is the Lord's meal. That if he is calling to you and you have to respond, you need to respond, then we would invite you today to receive the, the bread, the body of our Lord, to drink the cup, the blood of our Lord, that you would taste today that in your darkness there is light, there is hope, the God, the creator of the universe, has come to us. Hear these words before I pray for us. Hear these words from the first chapter of John. This is how John starts. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. And what has come into being in him was life. And the life was the light of all people. And the light shines in the darkness. Because the darkness did not overcome it. Even in the midst 
a world in which bombs take the lives of 200 Christians gathered on Easter Sunday morning. The darkness will overcome. The darkest of your fears and doubts, darkness will overcome. The risen Son, the Lamb of God, will find us, and His light is coming. So friends, I pass on to you that which was first passed on to me. That on the very night that our Lord would be betrayed, He first took the bread, and after giving thanks, He broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Eat of it as often as you must. He then took the cup of the, of the new covenant, saying, This is my blood shed for you. Drink of it as often as you must. For every time you eat of this bread, you drink of this cup, you do so proclaiming my death. And now we know this resurrection, that this is the light that shines in the darkness. In just a second, the servants and the table will come. And I will serve them first. There will be three across the front here and then three more in the back. And the center section will be a gluten-free option if that is what you need. I'll pray for us and they'll make their way to the places. And then I would invite you to maybe just sit. And when you are ready to respond, when you're ready to turn, then make your way to any one of the six stations. Yep, it will be a little messy. It's all right. That's the way family is, right? I know your family meals here in a few minutes, and they're going to be messy too. We'll just take our time. We'll sit and we'll wait on the Lord together. So let me pray for us. Oh, gracious God, who has come to us, who through the graciousness of your love has sought us out, Lord, we pray that once again you would take these ordinary elements of bread and juice and through your spirit, that you would transform them, that you would be uniquely present with us today in the bread and in the juice. O oh, gracious God, we give you all glory and honor and all praise for the ways in which you have already been at work and what you're going to do. The Lord, may the future of your kingdom crash into the present reality of today. For it's in your name that we ask and we pray, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
while it was still dark. But it ends with Mary proclaiming, I have seen the Lord. So friends, as we leave this place, and as we are sent back into the dark world, may we go with the great confidence that we do not go by ourselves. But rather it is God who is always with us, even in the darkest of places, who now sends us in order that we can bear witness to him, that collectively we can say, we have seen the Lord. Go in his peace, you are dismissed.